friend used to have your job, and I never got charged these charges. <laughs> and your friend's name understand. was? <laughs> I never got these charges before when my friend had your job. Chad, Chad LFG. I think he needs an upgrade. Yeah, they Chris, can you're take getting, it. You're getting a heads up on your level. Yeah, you're a little low, Chris. Chris. I could have sworn I said that earlier. You make us happy too, see a Chad. Hang there, Chad LFG. Do that. We can play Thumbelina Dance when we do Thumbelina Dance. Topo Gijo. Topo Gijo. Eddie. Oh, that was Yoni. Yoni? Zarai, Zarai. Senior Winces. Whatever. He lived very long. Winces lost. I think he lived to be about 100, Senior Winces. He was still performing. Larry Bud Melman on the Letterman show. Whatever happened to Larry Bud Melman? Yeah. He passed on. He did. To the great comedy store in the sky. He actually had a, he toured the country with a stand up. Can you believe that? Yeah, he's much better straight. Well, he was a much better straight man, you know, to re receive the, uh, the jokes. It was just a caricature, you know? Yeah, exactly. Played that well, but you know, I don't know if he had a good writers. If he took it out on the road, yeah, he'd, he'd have to work with somebody. Then the guys that had the deli or the, uh, the restaurant down below yeah. the uh, Thirty Rock or wherever he was they, going to show from. Who was the guy on uh, the tonight stand can that would always demo the stuff that would never work and he'd get all nervous and it would break and, and the Tonight Show? Stupid pet tricks. Stupid human tricks. And monkey can. Great Letterman. Man. Gag. Do you think Dave could uh, put Velcro on and uh, jump at a, at a wall? And you know, he stole that from age? Steve Allen. You know, Steve really? Allen used to do those human, stupid human tricks. He was the human tea bag. He covered himself with tea bags. Not a crane lift him into a, a giant vat of cold water to make iced tea for the entire audience. Did he uh, also have uh, Will It Float? Will It Blend? No. I, I enjoy David Letterman, He, you know, even on his interview shows, but the beard scares me. It's just too, uh, too biblical. Too Methuselistic. That too. To coin a word. And Chris does not have his headphones on today. Look more streamlined, Chris. Have a good show, folks. Thank you, one and all. Thank you all for being here.
Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Great to have you here again with us today. If you've come via YouTube, remember, uh, we want to know and want to know more about what we do. Remember to head over to officehours.global. That's kind of the central repository of how you can learn about how the show functions and what we're all about. Our primary web portal, essentially, for more information. Our second hour today, we're going to continue our explanation of HDR, High Dynamic Range Video. And coming back are Michael Drazen and Jim Toten, who are with us in March. This time, uh, they're bringing their their colleague Chris Seeger to explore the changing landscape of HDR and broadcast and beyond. It should be a fascinating show. For, so for those of you who are interested in what's happening kind of at the top end of the industry, because these people work on these small shows like the Super Bowl and NFL and stuff like that, uh, that's going to be our second hour and it should be really illuminating. Uh, but this is our first hour, of course, and we're going to hear, uh, we're here to address your audience questions. So let's dive in. Mitch, what's up for today? Thank you, Bill. Our first question, which we love so much, is coming in from Craig McFarlane in Boston, Massachusetts. Craig says, aside from office hours research, do you think you're spending more or less time checking if you should swap or add to your main apps, utilities, or gear compared to three years ago? Interesting way to look at things. Alex, what say you? I think I've been in a general state of upgrading for 30, 30 years. So, you know, it's, it's, you're always looking for what, what, could, what could you add? What could you make better? Uh, you know, I, so I think that it hasn't really changed that much as far as the, the speed of which it goes. I think that my major sources are mostly office hours, Twitter, and YouTube. I mean, those are the places that I probably go the most to figure out what gear is, is floating around. Those are my big sources. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm slowly, um, it's, it's always something. There's always a package showing up on the door. Uh, most most times small, sometimes large. Anyway, yeah. Mitch Hill. Isn't there some adage that says that uh, every CPU cycle needs to be used up by something? So you tend to uh, expand your system to fit the available cycles or cores in your system. I try to do the opposite because I will mess it up. Uh, Courtney Gooden. Well, being the economical person, what I do is... I'm amazed by how much cheaper stuff gets as it, you know, that does the same thing. So I'm always out trying to see, well, look, I can buy a computer that does the same thing as my desktop does for $150 that I used to pay, you know, $3,000 for. So I'm totally amazed by that. And I will buy it just to amaze myself. This caused me, this question caused me to reflect back. And I, I originally got my first Macintosh through a thing called the Own a Mac program. It was in uh, 84 when they first came out. So I had one of the first ones in town. At the time, it shipped with three programs. It had McWrite, McPaint, and Microsoft didn't have anything yet. There was a little database program called Habidex, and those were the only three programs that would run on the computer. So after maybe three or four months of working with it, I, I suddenly went, oh, I want to buy some more software. I went looking for it. There was nothing else to run on it. Those days immediately stopped, and the flood of programs came in. And from that month on, I have always felt like there's so much more ahead of me than behind me in terms of the tools that we can use that can help us uh, leverage all the efficiency of these computers, these machines that have really changed the entire world. So I, I think it's going to get nothing but more complex as we go forward. Uh, the idea of curation, finding people that you trust who know how these things work and can recommend the right program out of nine or 30 competing packages, it becomes more and more important to me as I go along. So that's how I think about it. I don't think it's going to get easier. I think it's going to continue to get more complex as time goes. So I'm relying on more and more good friends like the other panelists here to navigate me through this world. Let's get to the next question. I have a question. Uh, now that we're into hot, muggy weather... Uh, what's your procedure for moving cameras and lenses from an air conditioning environment to hot and humid environments? Courtney, start us off. Well, I usually try and equalize the temperature before you uh, move the equipment. We, uh, I did a shoot in, in Alaska where it was 20 below, and we were shooting with film cameras, and we had to keep the film cameras outside at night so they would be the same temperature as the air temperature when you brought them out to avoid you know, immediately you know, uh, fogging up when we took them back inside. So um, there's that. Try and equalize it, uh, equalize the temperature or leave the equipment in the uh, temperature that it's going to be used in so it doesn't have to suddenly suffer temperature shock and condensation. Alex Lindsay. 
Yeah, exactly. You know, one of the, the things that we we do oftentimes is that you know it's it is a um, number one is keeping the box really dry. So a lot of times we'll use desiccators in there. Um, so we'll have a lot of desiccant um, that is in there. You can get um, there are these cool desiccant balls that you can get that are I think gray and they turn blue over time. But they you can bake them and they'll just bake out the water and then you can do it again. And so you put you put a bag of those in into your because if you keep it bone dry, you're going to be a little bit better off as far as that goes in the case. But as soon as you pull it out, of course, there's humidity. And so one of the things that we do is exactly what Courtney's talking about. Now, I've had the issue where I'm in a nice air-conditioned hotel uh, in Cambodia, and I'm going to go shooting in the morning, and you really have to leave the cases out. So, um, you know, so the two things is making sure that it's really dry just so you don't end up with you, – what you don't want really is a lot of that condensation happening all the time regardless. Even if you put it out without the desiccant, you're going to end up with – moisture on your electronics and then and then on and off and so you want to keep it dry and then let it war let it warm up um, a lot of times we l look for hotel rooms with a balcony <laughs> and then we put the, tech, the the stuff out there um, or if it's in a separate room where we can crack it and let that room get hot um, those are all kinds of things we do um, to try to do it or you just get there early and know that there's an hour or two that it needs to get up to up to speed um, but it is a it is a big problem and you have to really think about it the larger the glass is the longer it's going to take to get done so if you have a cheap little 1.8 50 millimeter it's going to sort itself out in 15 or 20 minutes if you have an angie new lens it might take hours you know before it's completely um uh, uh warm because it, it, the glass has mass and so you have to kind of think through that as well uh mitch hill yeah and uh just so you know what that glass does take a look at this glass that's just from cold water uh, in a humid environment, you know, and all that. How do you get the, the uh, condensation out of the lens if, if, if you got to shoot quickly? What's the fastest way to do that? If the inside of the lens is now got dew in it. I have uh, seen people use hair dryers to warm it up, but it, it works. I scares the, you know, <laughs> scares me. <laughs> like I would not, do, I wouldn't, Scares I wouldn't, I wouldn't heat my lens uh, with a hair dryer. But I have seen people use hair dryers to to warm the lens up. But it's not, it's out. It, I haven't seen it do any damage. But man, does it seem like a bad idea? Cordy Gooden. Yeah, as a three D printer aficionado, you have to keep your filament dry. So uh, I use a lot of these this dry and dry uh, desiccants uh, that have indicators on them. And like uh, Alex says, it turns from. Uh, purple to pink as it starts to uh, absorb water. And I just throw a bunch of those into a, uh, I get uh, a hermetically sealed uh, plastic tub that has the O-ring around the top of it. So it's, it's tight. I throw about 30 of these packets in there and I store the, uh, store the filament in there and it dries it out quite nicely. Uh, and if that doesn't even work, there's also these dehumidifiers that use a Peltier uh, chip in it uh, to pull moisture out of the air and you can stick one of those inside there and let it run overnight and it will pull the moisture out of the air and keep it to about uh, relative humidity meter gets down to about 17 or so so that that's pretty good that's a great way to, to remove the moisture from the air and from anything you know with inside the lens etc and chris fenwick the answer is post-production stay indoors Nice air-conditioned room, <laughs> heated in the winter. Avoid all this lens problem. <laughs> this is why. This is why I picked post-production. You know, it, 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 when I do production, a lot of times there's in my rider. There's oftentimes we, you know, without we cannot be put outside without prior, uh, you know, consent. Uh, the the temperature of the room has to be seventy-five degrees or less for our equipment. Now I say it for our equipment because. What it's really for is the operators, um, you know, because I'm like, people don't think well over 75 degrees for, you know, all day, people get drowsy. And so, um, but I, but I use the equipment as an excuse, but, but I am not a big fan of outdoor, outdoor production. Mitch Hill. Yeah. And it's not limited to cameras. Uh, and there's other gear that, uh, Courtney, I believe there's uh, some microphones, some shotguns that once they get damp from that, uh, they cease to operate. Ships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and it used to be that their cameras had these dew lights on it, little tiny red lights at dew. <laughs> if the camera got too moist and hot over the yeah, course of time, the, it would just yeah. shut down. You couldn't couldn't use the it. Stiction. The stiction, the stiction on metal, the tape. It was the metal rotating head. If it got dew on it, the same thing with data machines. We had a dew light on it, 
Because if you'd take a field DAT machine out, because it has a rotating head, just like a VCR, and that's a metal head. And if dew con condenses on that metal head, when you take it out, it tries to wrap the tape around it. It's going to just stick to it. Yeah. So anyway, so it's easier today than it used to be back in the older days. Let's move on. That was fun. And uh, next question in from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Andy asks, uh, thoughts on the new Sony A6700 and FX30 specs, 4K30 UVC for Zoom? Alex. It looks promising. Uh, it is a, so this is basically a brand new Sony camera uh, that is, I think that the hard part is Sony is really attacking the sub $3,000 market with lots of different cameras to a point where it's hard to figure out which one is the best camera because they're all, you really have to be very careful of the specs on these cameras. Um, so this camera is, um, it does UVC straight out of the camera, which the FX30 does as well. Um, so you can just plug USB-C straight into the camera and then into your computer and it'll act as a webcam. Uh, they finally figured that one out. <laughs> so, so they, you know, like, let's just put that in the, into the camera. Um, it is, um, it does do, it'll do 1080i, it'll also do 4K. Um, so, so it has those things in there. We think that they've, because they're really pushing this towards the web camera usage, we think that they probably handled some of the heat issues that are there. It's a Super 35 sensor. Um, so it's a, it looks like a pretty strong camera. It, it's it's close to the same price as the FX30. I mean, it is a couple hundred dollars less, so you could save a little bit of money um, um, using the using this camera. But I I do feel like there's this cluster of Sony cameras between twelve hundred and two thousand dollars, and it's, it gets confusing as to which one makes sense. And you feel like you have to kind of very carefully look through each piece of this um, to to figure it out. Um, I'm pretty happy with the FX30, um, but I think that. I could be tempted. What I really want to see is a Super 35 sensor or full frame sensor under a thousand dollars. You know that that you would really use as a webcam. Um, they're still trying to do two different things: photos and video and everything else. Um, and and I I think that Sony is missing missing an opportunity to build a camera that people want to use just as a web camera. And we'll see if they take out because there's a lot of things in that camera that are make it more expensive because they're trying to make it multi purpose. Um, they have great, they've got great autofocus. They've got great, you know, they've got all the pieces that that they need. And and it seems like what they what they really need to do is just build a camera that is, um, that's going to take advantage. That's just going to be a web a web camera or just a little um, studio camera. I think that that's hopefully where Sony's going to go at some point. Mitchell, I think the uh, the ZV series is sort of knocking on that particular door. It was a bunch of them. Now. It used to be a ZV one. I have an E10 behind me. Um, they have a lot of them, but they, they're basically vlogging cameras. But what's great about all of these cameras from Sony, even in the low end, they all have that great auto zoom. And, excuse me, auto focus. <laughs> auto zoom would be interesting. Uh, let's go to Courtney. Yeah, it sounds a little pricey. It's about, I looked the price up, and it's uh, the body plus kit lens, uh, 16 to 50 is. Uh, 1500 bucks. So it's a bit, you know, about twice the price of the Canon M50 Mark II that I'm looking, you know, you're looking at me on right now. It does have the great high speed autofocus. That's one great thing it has going for it. But it's a, in a similar class, I think, of, uh, well, it's got a higher sensor. I think it's got a little better sensor, but it's awfully pricey. All right. Let's move on to the next question. And it's from Douglas Carmichael asking, how do you diplomatically communicate with a client that their requests are impractical with the resources available without damaging your relationship? Mm, touchy subject. Courtney, help us out. Well, you just say, sure, we can do it that way. Let me let me just get on the phone here and make a few calls. And uh, I'll pencil in, you know, what it's going to cost now. Uh, you have to be able to come up with the the tripling of the budget that it's going to cost, but you know, we can get it done for you. We just need a little more time. <laughs> Alex. Exactly. Uh, it's the same thing. Absolutely. This sounds like a great idea. Um, let me get back to you on how much that's going to cost to make those changes. And we'll, uh, we're hundred percent behind it. That's, that's usually, <laughs> you know, like, you, you know, if you're, <laughs> if you're doing work for people, it's like, you know, it's your nickel. Like, you know, and I have, I have done some crazy, like someone came up, we were working on a project and someone, at the last minute asked for something and I said, that's great. I mean, I, I think this is gonna be transformational and it's gonna cost about $400,000 to, to get that done. And two days later they said, okay, we're in, where do we sign? And I was like, 
Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and it and it built the infrastructure for a lot of things. But it was just like it was you gotta get this was on top of that they were already, you know, we were they were already spending eight hundred thousand dollars on what we were working on. And 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 so there was another four hundred thousand dollars on top of it for something that lasted uh less than a minute. You know, like it was it was a it was a very expensive minute. Um but but it was but but to to Courtney's point, I did not say no. I did not say that was hard. I told them it was a great idea. It was transformational. People remember it. I'm really excited. And this is how much it's going to cost <laughs> you know, to do. And they said, you, you don't want to think that. I think a lot of people make mistakes telling clients that, oh, you can't do that. Or, oh, that's going to be really hard. Or, oh, that's going to be, you know, to me, anything is possible with time and money. You're like, just you give me time and money. And I, I had a, a billionaire once ask me how much I said that. I said, anything's possible with time and money. Because he, he was spending a lot of money on something. And um and he said, well, how long, how much would it cost to uh, put a man on, or put, to stream from a camp, a stream from the moon? And I said, uh, it's between 15 and 20 billion and I need 10 years. But I said, but there's a lot more if you have to put a person on there. <laughs> but, but, but I was like, but, but, but if I, if I only have to land a camera on the moon and take a video of the earth, I said, I can, I can, I can do that between 15 and 15 and 20 billion and uh, 10 years. And he, he said, I'll think about it. He had the money. He just, just didn't spend it. Chris Fenwick. Uh, I, Alex, I realize you can't tell us everything, but you got to tell us a little bit about what the 400 add-on was. Uh, it was, it was a, um, uh, I can't uh, ask on Sunday. I'm not going to put it on YouTube. <laughs> okay. So I will say, I will say this. I had a thing happen with me uh, years ago where I had agreed to do a project. Uh, the people said, look, this is a, this is a, a really tight budget. Can you do it for this much? Yes, we can. And I said, but I do want to hire this one camera guy. And I said, here's a link to his reel. It's on my website. Please watch it. It's going to cost a little extra, but we need to have this guy. And the woman, uh, the producer, went to my website, watched his reel. Then, using the navigation, stepped out a couple layers, down a couple things, in, and watched a video that was clearly outside of her budget. It was way outside of her budget. And she goes, hey. But, and within like 20 minutes, she calls me. She goes, hey, I just watched this video on your website. It's fantastic. I want my video to look like that. And I'm like, mm, we could do that. But that's way outside your budget. And the idea of putting something in front of somebody, uh, you know, carrot stick kind of thing, um, it absolutely, I mean, it, it like quadrupled the budget on the video. It came out great. But I love the phrase, trend, what did you say, transformational? Transformational. I'm going to use yeah. that five times today. <laughs> I might use it uh, five times this show. I mean, no, Alex, we're coming back to you anyway. Go ahead. This this com this gets back to the fundamental thing that that action occurs when possibility is greater than circumstance. That is the math, and you and it doesn't matter what the the circumstance is. This is their budget, right? And they they need the possibility to line up with that circumstance. That's what's in their head, right? But if you give them a bigger possibility, they'll that's so much bigger. They'll figure the circumstance out, you know, um, or they won't, and then you won't do it. But, but there have been many times, you know, that I've, oftentimes I come in 20, 30, 50, sometimes a hundred percent more than the next person, you know, on the bid. And, but, but, but I've sent a deck and I've sent what we've done in the past and I come with recommendations and I, you know, all these other things that, that are there and they go, oh, this would be pretty cool. You know, because I mean, the thing is, is if you make a show that's okay for $50, um, that isn't going to make any impact, that isn't going to change anything. It might be worth spending 75 on something that does. You know, like, you know, like that's the whole thing. Sometimes people get realized they're, are they checking? The real thing is, is your client checking a box that said we streamed live or we produced a video or are they really trying to make an impact with that, that video? And that you have to figure out which, which one it is and telling them how much a change is going to cost. And what I will say is that a lot of clients will come up and ask for things that aren't that big of a deal. I have extra capacity and I give it to them for free. I, I try not to, I won't nickel and dime them unless they're doing something that really costs me money. You know, like, you know, and, and, um, and so uh, I, that's the thing that the, on the other side of this, you don't want to say, well, that's going to be another $40 or that's going to be another hundred dollars. I'll do everything I can to swallow small numbers, um, uh, including how I bid so that it's not something that they have to make decisions and go, oh, I really wish we had had this one extra camera or one extra lens. A lot of times when I owned all that stuff, I would, um, we, and we still do that with, with own, I know if I've got a bunch of extra cameras, I, you know, 
I'll throw another camera in. <laughs> like, you know, like it just, you know, and, and I'm not, you know, because it's not something there. And that makes it, it also makes it really hard for them to go to somebody else because most companies don't do that. And it puts them at a competitive disadvantage. Mitchell? Uh, to your point, Alex, don't you put a uh, 10% contingency fund on your light items? You try, but a lot of times you can't. Um, the reason is, is that people, t they'll take it out immediately. Oh, I don't want the contingency. So you have to kind of just be conservative on how you bid on everything. You know, so, so the, um, but, but putting a 10% contingency, people who've done this a lot, will put the 10% contingency in, but there's a lot of companies that will immediately strike the 10% out of the budget. So my story about this is back in my early, early career, I was just crawling out of low budget productions and trying to get up. Uh, and I got a package of three videos from a client. They proposed it and uh, I thought, yeah, I can probably get these done for, Oh gosh, let me just stretch out and say 30 grand because I had been doing like eight and ten thousand dollar videos. And so I thought, man, that's going to be, uh, you know, a little bit of a bump up. And when I sat there at the, I said, and I think the budget is around 30,000. And they nodded and went, that's great. And I don't think I looked really happy because I was thinking in my head, wow, I sold this. This is great. And by pausing a minute, I heard the the best word I ever heard from across the desk, which was each. And I immediately went from thirty to ninety thousand dollars for that project, and I, it was a big lesson for me. You never know what the person on the other side of the desk is expecting, so sometimes um, you're you're way undervaluing what the project works is worth. Alex. In the same case, you also have to look at what kind of company you're working with. I I had a bid for one time for a company that I. Uh, I bid $90,000, which was a lot for me. And the person that, that I was talking to, this is a pretty big company uh, in the South Bay. And um, they said, uh, I don't think you should do that. <laughs> like, this is the person that worked there. <laughs> like, they were like, I think that it needs to be a lot bigger because there's going to be a lot of revisions. Like, like, you know, like, I know that you've done things with smaller, you know, so you have to be careful. Like, they were protecting me from just getting drowned, you know, that, you know, like that, that it was, it was like, you know, I think that that, that's going to have to be a lot, a lot higher. This is two decades ago. You know, this is tw 20 years ago that I was bidding on something and they were just like, oh, I don't, I don't think that you can survive that. And I've done things. I bid on one project for, uh, I bid on one project for $5 million and they didn't return my call because it was 10 times too low. Like it was like they wanted to build a studio in the Middle East <laughs> and it was, and they were like, no one's going to, no one can talk about this at dinner if it's, if it's only 5 million. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so I was like, okay, I, I missed that one. Yeah, these anyway. are the subtleties as you move from being yeah. an amateur at something to being a professional. Yeah. You, you learn you're in the wrong league. Yeah. Um, don't forget. This show is driven by your questions. Uh, so it, we always encourage you to put in additional questions. As you listen to the show, things will come up, pop into your mind. Add them as questions into our Makana interface. And when you do that and your question goes in there, everybody should vote on them because the show obviously is driven by the best questions. And that means your votes count on those questions. So vote are the ones you'd like to see us get to more quickly and spend more time on. Next question. Andy Tang from Bastrop, Texas. Headline, SAG-AFTRA negotiating committee votes unanimously to recommend strike as Hollywood stalls talks or talk stall. How will this affect the office hours per po uh, population of panelists and producers? Courtney, start us off. You've been in the union for a long time and are deep. I'm ready. My picket sign now, Alex. Uh, if you agree to double our salary as panelists, which I think you've agreed to, um, <laughs> I think we can continue on Twist my arm. Uh, portraying Twist my arm. the parts of panelists as we are. I'm doubling your pay. I'm doubling your pay. I'm doubling your pay. Absolutely. Oh, everyone here is going to get paid twice as much as they were paid. I'm proud of it. There's a car underneath your chair. <laughs> <laughs> it shouldn't affect us. And by the way, they have not. Strike isn't definitely called yet. They're, the National Board of the Screen Actors Guild is meeting this morning. And they were having a news conference at noon today, whether they will go on strike or not. But the negotiating committee could not come to a conclusion last night uh, with the producers. And the producers are holding out uh, for, uh, you know, holding firm to their, you know, last year's deals. And John Predlo, sadly, the car is virtual. So just want to let you know. <laughs> All right, moving on. Oh, I, I think uh, I had a... a oh, oh, I'm sorry, Alex. You yeah, were in there. Yeah, I thought I, that guy... I think yeah. that... Um, uh, 
I, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch. I think this is going to be, this is going to define the industry. I think, I think this is a big set of, th this is not like a minor little strike. Um, this is over some big terms. Uh, it's the future of the industry. Uh, are actors and uh, writers going to get residuals? I mean, I think that's what they're really fighting over. I mean, the AI stuff is something they're fighting over and everything else. But the problem is, is they have all these streaming companies that that are not going to pay, do not want to pay re residuals. It's too complicated for them. It means they have to show numbers. It means they have to, there's a whole bunch of reasons they don't want to do it. The real challenge, I was thinking about this this morning, actually, the real challenge for the Screen Actors Guild and the Writers Guild is that the streamers can go for a long time. They have huge libraries that we have only scraped the surface of as far as our viewership. And they could probably last a year or two. You know, like like they can go for a long time, you know, without having to have new content because they've got content that's still coming out. And then they have all of this, um, you know, all of this uh, back catalog. I mean, I'm watching shows that are years old and people will just start digging into the history and in, digging into history, um, you know, and watching things. They're not going to. And what's interesting is, is that what really is going to be damaged potentially is for TV producers and film producers and theater change and everything else. This is potentially devastating there may not be any movies in 2025 or very few good ones because you know if this if this if this strike lasts through the end of the year which it could um you know you could end up with no nothing coming out the other end um you know uh, in 2025 and so what would happen the chain reaction of all of this could be a spike in actual streamer usage. So the thing that they're striking against could be a lot of people getting used to using streaming because there's no TV shows, there's no movies, there's no, you know, like there's nothing good out there, like really good out there. At a time when streaming is ramping up, the chain reaction could be, you know, pretty, pretty devastating. In addition to the fact that it's probably really good for uh, YouTubers because, and TikTok and everything else. So all the things that are not TV and film um, may expand, um, including live streaming, which is a lot of what we do. Um, all that may expand to a really um, sizable, you know, impact while the things that we're paying the bills goes, you know, kind of fades into the background. And so, and then that actually gives the, the guilds less leverage than they had before. Um, you know, and so, so I think that it could be a really interesting, a really problematic thing. And we'll see, we'll see what happens. That's, I'm not saying that's the way it should happen. I'm just saying that that's, I think that the trajectory, that's a possible trajectory that's probably not good for what they're striking for. I, I found it also interesting that uh, the AMPTE, the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, which is on one side of this, has about 350 uh, members. Technically, that may be member organizations, so I'm sure there's more actual individuals. The uh, SAG-AFTRA, uh, the Screen Actors Guild and uh, the uh, Association of AFTRA, AFTRA, Anyway, I can't remember. American Federation of Television, Radio Television, Arts. Radio. Thank you. Uh, has about 160,000 members. So this is really an interesting battle between a, a relatively small group of producers who control most of that in the U.S. and a very large organization. So all the economic costs of something that goes in the direction of the SAG After Group is going to cost a good bit to the other side, but the, the other side has made well, a lot of money over the course of time. So it's it's an interesting battle of giants in some ways. And we may see a lot of uh, overseas productions, you know, ending up in, Absolutely. in production as well. So that's the other yeah, thing. Yeah, if you can just decamp for a different country under a different mm -hmm. set of agreements, that solves the problem. And it's a global economy now. Uh, oh, Chris Fennick wants to get back in on this. Chris? I was going to say, first of all, Andy, I love Bastrop, Texas. Secondly, uh, since the... Inter excuse me, interesting side note. Since the beginning of the strike, Netflix stock has done nothing but go up. Interesting thought. Yeah, Mitch Hill. I think Alex is on to something because there's not a gigantic pile of money here. It is show business, and I am sympathetic to the union's plights, but uh, the pile of money at the center of the table may be getting slightly larger, but um, it's, it's tough, and something's got to give. And that give means that maybe we're not going to see as many movies being made. Maybe we're not going to see uh, as good a talent. Maybe it's going to be offshore that does the production. Uh, it's a very interesting situation, but a correction is necessary. And I do agree with that. Courtney? Well, you were mentioning the numbers. Of that 160,000 uh, Screened Actors Guild members, 
only about five to 10% make enough to earn a living uh, at it, uh, out, out of that 160,000. So, so most of those actors that are getting the $20 million, you know, the, they're not really the people they're negotiating for. They have, you know, way above scale deals anyway. So they won't be affected necessarily by changes in rates and working conditions. But it's all the day players, you know, all the, the background uh, people, et cetera, that, that try and make a living at it, which is probably about less than, you know, 10% of the, uh, of the total number. And I tell you, they're going to have to, the whole problem comes from the fact that the way the industry is changing, and I know IA had the same problem with their new media contracts, which is they gave a break uh, back when stuff was being produced for just direct to streaming because it wasn't network TV. It wasn't theatrical release. It was, you know, uh, the equivalent of direct to DVD only it was direct to streaming. So they made a deal, uh, you know, several years ago to do a much lower rate, about half to do direct to streaming. But now that streaming has become mainline as a major means of distribution uh, by the majors, uh, all the major uh, producers have their own streaming services. So uh, now that that's the case, they want to change the contract to be more in line with, you know, how it was for, you know, major television production and theatrical production. But the producers are wanting to hold on to that 50% deal. And I think they're using this as a means of trying to break the unions. And if they can uh, get uh, a lot of people to say, well, you know, I, I have to work for a living, so maybe I'll just work non-union. Uh, that's what uh, you know, these multinational corporations that control the purse strings of all the uh, streaming companies are, are trying to break the unions. I think that's what they're trying to do. But the, by the way, your, your mention of the EU, I think the, the SAG after in the EU is going to cooperate with the strike. So I'm not sure if they'll be able to flee the country and uh, produce things in Canada or Europe. Big changes in a complex issue, but thanks for bringing it up, Andy. And uh, it's something we should talk about here uh, whenever we can and keep you up to date on the, the latest happenings. Let's go on to the next question. Next in from Chris Fenwick in Emeryville, California. And right here on our panel, Chris asked for our resident and self-appointed AI expert, John Preto. What do you make of the new AI offering announced by Uncle Elon, XA1? John Preto. Oh, Elon. Elon's a little sour that <clears throat> OpenAI, which he founded, <clears throat> it's a great story. Elon is one of the founders of OpenAI. He got together and helped recruit a lot of the top scientists into OpenAI. Then he got in a fight with Sam Altman and Greg Brockman over the, over the uh, direction, the strategy of OpenAI. Uh, they, he wanted to keep it open, hence the name OpenAI. And then Microsoft came knocking. Now it's closed AI because it's not open source. And so this is Elon trying to get back at them for being the most successful application of all time. Don't tell me Threads is. I'll, I'll get in an argument with you if you tell me Threads is more successful than open AI is. Uh, and, and Elon was behind this pause for six months. Uh, he's the one that, that propagated that uh, document out to get everybody signed to stop developing AI. For six months that was him wanting to catch up and tesla by the way is one of the largest ai purveyors on the planet they have more ai computers from nvidia than than anybody else all of the images from the cars are being transmitted back to their infrastructure and in ai they got a ton of these nvidia h100s and e100 cards so this is elon being elon mitchell uh by the way uh, john prado is available to speak at uh, any of your special events rotary bar mitzvahs, uh, bachelor parties, anything. He'll be there for you. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Let's go on to the next question. From Douglas Carmichael. Alex, you mentioned that most people who uh, use Mac OS automation, like Alfred, only use one computer. If you use a utility like SyncThing to sync your preferences across each computer you use, wouldn't that be easier? Uh, Alex, what are your thoughts? It just never works. I'm just saying, okay, you can, we can, it's, it's very wishful thinking that that'll work. And it just, it just never, it, it, you know, trying to get all the computers, I have so many computers and they're from different versions and trying to have something, trying to sync them. It's just easier not to automate things and learn, learn how to like change the key keys. It's just, you just want to learn how to use the, 
the way that they are set up, in my opinion. Um, if I only use one computer, I used to have one computer and I did have things like Alfred and I had all these automations and everything else. But as soon as I went to another computer, I was like, oh, you know, like it's just, and trying to get some app that's actually going to sync everything, it's not going to happen. It's been interesting for me just moving from the old Intel class to the M2, which is in my current laptop that's in front of me. The The power just keeps growing so exponentially. Some things do not accelerate a ton, depending on the kind of things you're doing. But some things are just so snappy that I wonder how much more computing power I'm ever going to need. Of course, I said that about hard drives back when I had an 11 megabyte Corvus, and I was so utterly wrong about how that was going to develop. I could be wrong about this, but boy, these, these modern computers are just amazingly faster than anything I've ever touched before. Courtney Gooden? Uh, yeah, I don't have a lot of Mac OS stuff, uh, but I do run into the synchronization issue because I have hundreds of computers. The uh, The problem I would get into is uh, if you have a Dropbox, let's say, on all these computers, and then you know some project comes along where on this particular computer we've got to download uh, you know 15 hours of video, suddenly you find that Dropbox is trying to synchronize all of your other hundreds of computers with that 15 hours of video when they've just come to a grinding halt. So you've got to be very careful with synchronous, automatic synchronization. Uh, and the best thing I do, I like to store the stuff in the cloud and not synchronize it locally. Uh, if there's anything that I need to have access to on all the computers, I make sure it works in a browser or it is uh, stored in the cloud that has access through the browser. So that that way, when I launch any any computer, I just log into my account, like a Google account, and uh, then I find all of the stuff that I've stored in the cloud and all my bookmarks and everything right there, passwords, et cetera. And then I don't have to worry about syncing individual programs onto the individual hard drive. All right. We do have uh, room for a couple more questions before the end of the show. So make sure you do that and vote on the ones that are coming up. Uh, but right now we're going to the next question. Next one in from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul wants to know, Prime Day came again. Deals at Amazon, Target and Walmart, etc. Were you able to sift through all the noise and find stuff you actually need? Alex, did you find anything for Prime Day? I don't know if I needed it. <laughs> so, <laughs> Me is such a big word. Uh, I got another Stream Deck because I was missing. I, I had kind of permanently put another Stream Deck over here. So I got another of the, I don't know which one it is. It's the 15 key. I didn't get the bigger one. It was, but it was a pretty good price. And it actually showed up. It actually arrived. It's, uh, I got it around here somewhere. Anyway, and then I got another of the, um, of this Melees because um, I'm building this little, these smaller monitors here that I need to display things like the teleprompt view and a couple other views there. So I wanted something, and it was, the melees were not very expensive. So, um, and uh, I think I got one more thing, but I can't remember what it was. But yeah, nothing, I didn't go crazy. <laughs> just just a couple little things. Courtney? I got another uh, Fire Streaming Stick 4K Max for $24, which is a great streaming choice. Uh, I also ordered, uh, um, you can never have enough of these digital calipers. I think they were like, uh, I think it was $15 on um, stream on uh, Amazon Day, so I got another one of those. I need to have every location you are, so you can pull it out and measure stuff if you're going to be 3D printing. Yeah, I think when when these big sales uh, hit, though, also sometimes I find software deals, and I got pinged uh, that in honor of Amazon Day, there was one of my plugin manufacturers was putting their plugins at fifty percent off. So I managed to snag a couple of little plugins that I use on the audio side, particularly for my book work that uh, I liked. Chris, you had some thoughts. I'm remarking on the, the sentence, you can never have too many of these digital calipers. I want to go to dinner at Courtney's house. <laughs> I want to look in Courtney's house. careful not to sit on the digital calipers because they're I, everywhere. I, I'm, I'm, I, I suspect that my wife is is – in her sleep, throwing away silverware, and you have digital calipers in every room of your house. This is this is a crazy world you live in. We had to deal with that with my wife with cookbooks. You never have too many cookbooks. I'm, I'm tired of moving all these cookbooks. Can we get the ver di you know digital versions of them somehow? Put them on an iPad. Uh, next question. John Snyder, Reno, Nevada, comes in with: Is there a way to force users to see a full video when playing out to Microsoft Teams meetings? Microsoft Live events is always full video, but Teams crops depending on users' window size. You can ask people to fit to frame 
but that's dependent on the user. Alex, what say you? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think you can do that. Uh, you know, I, I, I now I will admit that I only interact with MS Teams um, a couple times a week. You know, so you know, and it shows up. And uh, I don't, I don't think that there is a way that I know of to to make that adjustment. It, I will admit that MS Teams drives me a little crazy. I'm just glad that most of my clients have gotten rid of Blue Jeans because that was the one that was the one that drove me more crazy than MS Teams. But we still have a couple MS Teams partners, and um, uh, it's considerably at first i thought i think i i had the impression that the teams was going to somehow catch up with zoom um and maybe they will and they're probably the second best behind zoom but the distance between them is dramatic you know like you know so it's it, it, they've they seem to have lost the i, I feel like microsoft has kind of lost the thread there you know of, of of how to create something that that you can actually produce great events with so sorry i don't i wish we had a better answer next question Laura Thompson from Beaumont, Texas, asking, Clarisworks had an easy-to-design-and-use database program. What would be the closest thing now, not Microsoft Access? Alex, what do you think? Well, I think Claris still has FileMaker, and FileMaker is still a very powerful app. You know, I don't know of a lot of other ones that are as easy to use, as easy to set up a database and build out um, as, as, um, as FileMaker. John Preto? I use Airtable and it's free up to 1200 rows and it's very similar to Claris and Access and everything else it completely runs in the cloud. It's great. Is it relational? Is it a relational oh, database? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's okay. rendered on SQL in the back end basically. Got it. Okay. So uh, Claris in the early days, FileMaker Pro was their main product, but when they went into web stuff, they also did a subset of that for the web called Bento. And Bento was actually a decent little kind of visual database. The thing about uh, FileMaker Pro is that it's kind of semi-relational. It's not full, but uh, it, it got refolded. It, it, they spun it off as a separate company. Apple started it. They spun it off as a second company, Claris. And then it's kind of this hybrid now. I understand it's used throughout Apple to manage a lot of their stuff because it's their in-house engineers and stuff like that. But it, I've always found it to be a supremely powerful and very extensible thing. I've got things that are probably 30 years old now, still running in FileMaker, and it still does fine. So pretty, pretty powerful program overall. Uh, let's go to the next question. From Jack Rupel in Breckenridge, Colorado. I'm trying to study the unseen part of snow avalanches before the snow starts to move. I'd like to use the audio equivalent of motion blur to examine this phenomenon using motion tracking data in video and connect it with audio metadata. Thoughts? Boy, you know, you've brought this up a couple of times, and I find it to be a fascinating thing that you're trying to do here. The only thing I can think of is that everybody I've ever talked to who is in motion tracking, and that's really what you're trying to do is figure out as the snow melts where it goes, has to place some sort of markers somewhere and then get some sort of image capture thing that happens over time such that you can determine where that marker is at the beginning and then as it starts to move where it progresses over time and then do your calculations for moving rates and things like that based on that. And snowpack is such a complicated thing to get out to, to set up a camera for, and to put markers there. Uh, I don't know whether satellite things could help you or whether that's accessible. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, I think that what would be interesting is to I think you need rods that are going to go into the, of course, the rods may cause their own problems, but rods that go in that are, that are going to be maybe solar powered or something like that so that you can feel, so the rod itself can feel pressure at different, you know, sections of it can feel pressure at, at different depths because I have a feeling that part of the problem with the snow slide, the snow movement is that it's happening deeper than the surface. And so tracking the surface is one piece of that. But a lot of what's happening might be below the you know, significantly, and you would know more than I would, but it feels like it would be a lot further below. And so finding ways, to, rods or other, other ways to drop sensors at different, at different depths um, that, that you can kind of see where that, where that flow is, is moving and then sync that back up to sound uh, would be, I think, interesting. I don't know how much sound a sensor would get in the snow. It seems like there's not a lot of, but, but having mics at the surface, um, being able to tell you what those are. And again, solar powered, they probably last, uh, they probably run all the time. So it'd be something to think about. It's a very fascinating problem. Courtney Gooden. Yeah, I was thinking maybe if you planted a few seismographs out there uh, in the bedrock when the snow was gone, 
and then had some means of getting a signal out through the snow to an antenna or something, a wire that runs up the antenna, you might be able to detect rock movement or something, you know, along the surface uh, with a seismograph before the snow, you know, one layer of snow starts to slip, which would cause an avalanche. You may be able to detect something in the acoustic, you know, acoustically uh, with an acoustic seismograph. But uh, that's all I got. Uh, let's go to Chris Fenwick. I got to tell you, I watched a video recently about detecting avalanches. I don't know why I got stuck in it's just a YouTube rabbit hole. But what they, what they do is they dig a hole deep that they can get into. And then at the surface, they take their snow shovel and they lay it down on the edge of the hole. And they have a very specific way that they pat, pat, pat pat the shovel down and they measure how much the snow compresses and the and the density of the snow and how much it compresses is vital to understanding the uh, uh propensity of the snow to cut loose an avalanche and i gotta tell you this this is science along the lines of like you know divining sticks and looking for water underground i don't know that i don't know that there's technology available that takes that that, that is ever gonna do what a real snow expert can gather by doing these these little experiments that they do. It it seems like an incredibly difficult thing to put a sensor on. It was a really interesting video I watched. Mitch Hill. Yeah, it's a shame we're not experts on it, but um, you know, I I think the question was how much notice do you need? Do you need to know if it's actually happening right then or is it going to happen? And some kind of subsonic uh, sensor, like a seismograph, like uh, what uh, Courtney was recommending, might make. But if you ever see a avalanche getting ready to happen, uh, the whole area that's going to fall just does this weird ripple. It's almost as if a wave goes through it, and it may be a subsonic uh, uh, sound that's going through, and that definitely is seismic uh, territory. Just to add confusion to <laughs> more confusion, uh, I once had a video that I shot up in the mountains of Colorado um, up uh, about dog sledding, and it was really fascinating. Uh, when we were taking the uh, the dog sleds, and I was on a quad that was set up for the snow with a camera mounted on it up to shoot behind the dog sleds, and they warned me very specifically, you know, we're going to be on a trail that we know you can't tell because there's more new snow on top of things, but do not turn right or left off this trail. And I said, why? He said, well, because the snowpack underneath it is different. They had to take the same trail up this very deep snowpack in Colorado up uh, to this place called Kablunik, which was the, the dog sled company up there. And... I actually got off my quad at one point and I had to do something on the back and I made the mistake of stepping off the trail and I sank to my hip on one leg. And so the density of the snow where it hadn't been packed by the consistent use of the snowmobiles and things like that versus the density of the snow where it had been packed was entirely different. So I don't know how you get sensors down into those various densities to figure out what is thawing what is moving it's just a very complex problem i would suggest maybe you talk to the folks at the bureau of land management or one of those people who have to do a lot of sensor placement out there and see if there's any institutional wisdom of how to measure snowpack and snowpack movement uh, a lot of those government agencies this is part of what they do and there might be something very useful in that so let's go on to the next question fascinating things jack thanks for bringing it up chris fritchie from tomball texas asks what and how is the best way to use scopes while recording in the studio or on site should a laptop be used for are there special displays to make this happen alex you don't really need a special display anymore um there are definitely ones that you can use uh, fabrix uh, makes some great ones leader makes great ones that are built in and they're all in one and they're calibrated and it's great but the the scope results will be identical to Nob Omniscope, which is what most of us use. Um, so Nob Omniscope is about 400 bucks. I think it covers two or three machines. Uh, you can run it on a, on a PC, Linux, uh, Mac. Uh, we run them on Macs. Um, and what's nice about it is it's very flexible. You can change the layout of it um, and, and really kind of figure out exactly how you want those scopes to be dis um, uh, to be displayed. And um, we use them all the time. And the main thing is you just need it to be a place where you can see it next to the image that you're working with. 
um, so that you really understand what you're looking at. Um, you can also do things like uh, when I'm doing green screen, I've actually done wireless transmission to uh, a monitor, you know, that I can that I can look at. Um, so that I can walk around and look at the green screen, change lights, move things around and, and look at the how they're affecting the scopes. So, um, but, you know, sometimes putting it also, uh, we, we put it on a stand, you know, sometimes on a junior stand with some wheels or onto a C stand where we can move it around and set it down and make it, make it available as we're working. Um, to, because a lot of times you're making those decisions in, in real time. Mitch Hill. Yeah, another uh, routine that I use is if I'm building a camera, um, you can attach a monitor to the camera stand or to the monitor or the to camera itself. And uh, I use uh, Feel Good or their namesake, Andy Cine, and they make uh, pretty good, but Atomos also has them. So you can see all the appropriate uh, waveforms you want to see. You want to see vector. You want to see a uh, histogram. You want to see a waveform. Courtney? Yeah, one good choice would be the Blackmagic 12K uh, Video Assist which is not only a recorder, but it also includes scopes and a, and a nice, you know, small monitor that you can use for monitoring on top of your camera as a viewfinder as well. And it has scopes you can switch to. It's all built into one and records as well on SD cards or external uh, SSDs. I also think of this as a scope at its best as a measurement device, so they should all work the same. So very much like a ruler, you can buy a ruler that's plastic and cheap. You can buy a ruler that's metal and costs more. Maybe it has cork on one side so that if you're putting an architect's desk, it doesn't slide off. But the tool primary function should always be the same. For a scope to be called a scope, it should be accurate. So uh, whether or not you're buying the extras, any scope you buy is better than no scope. And as a tool to get you an objective look at a signal, I don't. I can't imagine being in this business and not have scopes at my access and the understanding of how to use them. It's pretty mission critical here. Next question. Uh, from Douglas Carmichael, has anyone had experience with Antelope Audio products? Um, I've been mostly a fan of networked audio, but I'm interested in a solid standalone interface for a mobile setup. I have not. Now, I have heard of Antelope Audio for years, and I they have a very good reputation from everything I've heard about them, but I've never used them directly, and it appears that uh, nobody on the panel has uh, any more experience than that. You might want to slip back here on Wednesday. Wednesday is when our audio gurus are here, and they have much more experience with a wide variety of audio programs. So, Douglas, maybe sneak back in and do this question next Wednesday, and you might get uh, additional information. But I've heard good things about them. I just don't know that much, particularly, and have no direct use. Let's go to the next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, asking, Apple's My Photo Stream is set to shut down on July 26, 2023. So if you want to locally save any images from the service, you don't have long left. Does this affect you? Yeah, it doesn't affect me. I haven't ever used My Photo Stream. I think that's a subset of um, Apple's Photo app or Photos app or iPhoto, the original version of that. Uh, so only if you move things to Photo Stream for things like family sharing, I think, is part of what that used to do. Uh, that, those are the servers they're shutting down. Uh, so unless you've moved something over there and then deleted it from your regular iPhoto libraries or something like that, you're probably safe. But that support document that's linked. Um, there is a, a, a supported apple.com that talks about this directly. So if you have used photo stream in the past, probably a good idea to check that out before you hit the deadline. Next question. Next question from Douglas Car. Uh, yes, Douglas Carmichael. What would be the closest thing to HyperCard in the modern era? Yeah, that's a tougher one. HyperCard was an interesting little database program that Apple uh, made and gave away for free back in the early days of, I'm, I'm, going to use the term programming, but I'm not sure it's 100% programming. It was a visual thing that looked like a set of three by five cards, and you could put commands on it. So it was like a beginning uh, programming thing. Maybe Swift, which is, boy, that's that's like comparing a, a firecracker to a military piece of ordinance. Uh, Swift is a development language that can do websites and can do um, iOS apps and things like that beautifully. But it is also the simpler form of not having to dive into serious, well, I shouldn't say that because people are going to say, no, Swift is serious. But it's it's 
an earlier, more accessible and very modern programming language as opposed to the old, more complex things like assembly language and maybe C++ and the rest of those. Um, HyperCard was that for a buildable database in the early era. I, I think probably Swift is the closest thing. Maybe if you're going to develop something and you wanted to get into as simple as possible, there's a lot of resources for Swift developers. And I remember you some on the PC side. Courtney, are you aware of things? Uh, well, not necessarily on the PC. I was just going to suggest Apple Script is the scripting language. You know, it's uh, oh, that may be still closer. around that you could use that to do a lot of the stuff that you could with HyperCard, only it's not necessarily a a programming language per se, but it can be used to do a lot of automation. Um, yeah, the yeah, nice thing about HyperCard was it was pretty visual. It had that that kind of recipe box interface it, thing. It was skeuomorphic, but yes, you know, there's there's it's a, a skeuomorphic version of Apple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Apple was very skeuomorphic at one point. Their address book looked like a leather bound address book, and so everybody went, "I know what that is on my desktop." So anyway, uh, hopefully that helps, Douglas. Next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, has a question. How do the Focusrite Scarlett 6i6, the Audion ID14MK2, and the Tascam US 2x2 compare to the Lewitt Connect 6, other than being in the same price range? Paul, could you have been more specific? We need four or five other models to try to mentally compare. I'm, I'm teasing you a little bit, only because I don't know of anybody that's in my orbit who has those specific four things. Now, again, these are all audio pieces of gear. So maybe this is left over from yesterday, but Wednesday is typically where our audio team comes to focus on audio issues. So this might be a good question to hold off for next next Thursday. Uh, I, I think you were, or next Wednesday, I think you were there last Wednesday with this question. And so I know you continue to try to find this, or maybe it just keeps getting pushed back. But regardless, um, not today. I don't think we're going to we're going to be able to break down those particular pieces of equipment and figure it out today. Let's go on to the next question. Chris Fritchie from Tomble, Texas. Will the Nob Omni Omniscope run on a B Link computer? Uh, Courtney, did, uh, you didn't. Ra uh, Mitchell Hill raised his hand on this. So Mitchell. Well, I'm speculating here. Um, if it's a four core computer, I'm sure it will. Here's the thing. I think that Nob um, device you can get the free version. It'll run for like five. Uh, minutes or something like that. So you can try it out, see if it works okay. Fair enough. Courtney, you use the B-Links a lot. Did you have any thoughts about, about I use B-Links. I, I use a lot of uh, small computers. I just don't I don't use no Omniscope. So, uh, so I ne don't necessarily can tell you. If it runs under Windows, if they have a Windows version, it should run on any of the, uh, you know, the uh, Melees or the B-Links uh, because they're full Windows, you know, programs, full Windows Pro and uh, have enough, they all have come with enough memory these days. They come with at least eight gigabytes, uh, some of them 16 gigabytes, uh, and a full copy of Windows. So there'd be no reason they shouldn't as long as they have a Windows version of that scope. Fair enough. Time for the next question. And uh, we are plumb out of questions for now. Um, oh, are we? Into okay. the next hour. So. Fair enough. We can pick That's any right. subject for the next three minutes that you want to talk about. <laughs> now, I got a few things I can do here just to kind of fill things as we're waiting for our special guest, as we're waiting for uh, the folks uh, on the HD discussion to log in here. Uh, first of all, don't forget, there's a lot of the things that happen on office hours other than just the main program. Uh, for example... One of, the, one of our goals here is to help people learn as much about the back end of how the show gets built and uh, how things operate in office hours. We're always looking for additional volunteers, but just people who want to come and learn things. One of the best ways to do that, the show Conversations with Tony Mobley has been on for, for many, many months here at Office Hours. And there is every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, there's conversations with Tony Mobley behind the scenes. So this is a look at how that show is built in a breakout room here. Uh, it starts one hour before Tony's show. So if you're interested in how Office Hours works, one way you can find out more about what we do is to go into places like this. We also have our labs. Uh, typically on Thursdays, right after the main show, actually after a, a, one meeting after the main show, so at 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, one of our labs takes place every week, and that's their Isadora Lab with L. Wilson Spiro. That Isadora program is one of the things that's a building block of how Office Hours works in the back end. So it's an important uh, process if you want to learn more about how 
this whole show functions and how it comes to you, that's a great place to go in there and learn a very uh, – it's, it's an amazing opportunity to learn to use Isadora. And Isadora is kind of a control protocol, came out of the theater industry where people needed to time cues and drive events happening on the web. Very powerful thing to learn how to do. Um, and then things like the panelists and potential panelists meetings that coming up. Alex does that on the first Saturday of every month. So on July 15th, coming up in just a few days, there'll be the next version of that. That, again, is at 10 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. So if you're interested in being a part of the panelists uh, group here at Office Hours, uh, that's the place for you to be. We have reached the top of the hour, and I see our guests starting to pop in. Michael Drazen is here. Michael, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you, Bill? Good, good, good to see you. And I see Jim Toten has appeared. So we've got two of the three parts of the troika of our experts who are in today. Uh, Jim, how are you? Hey, I'm great. How are you doing today? Thanks for having us back. Uh, it, listen, the last session you guys did was fascinating. And I think a lot of our audience is interested in the, the, the part of the industry you guys work in, which is the highest levels of broadcast. And you are struggling through kind of some of the same, not struggling, but you're addressing the same things that everybody is interested in, how television, how broadcast, how media is going to be changing going forward into the future. And so whenever you show up and can help us kind of navigate a little of that, um, it's always good for the show, and we're always really happy to see you. So does one of you want to tell us a little bit about kind of what your what the – what the area that we're going to be looking at today, I know there's a deck and we've got another guest coming in, but Mike, do you want to start us off and tell us what's going on? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're super excited today because uh, we have our guest today, uh, Chris Seeger. And as we talked about in the last session that we did back in, uh, I think that was May, uh, a lot of this and a lot of what we've done to date in television, we have relied on waveforms and vector scopes and then subjective measurements outside of that. And as we got into HDR in this larger space, we really discovered that we need a way to objectively measure and quantify those measurements that we were taking. So we can compare different aspects, whether it's creating LUTs, whether it's hardware, what goes in, what comes out, how things get composited in the hardware. And like we, we found all these problems that we'd kind of taken for granted, the tools that we had and what they did, and also that, you know, there was some study and a lot of this came out of as Chris joins, like he and I stood in his lab and discovered that like, we both looked at the same image and had a different take of it. And it was like, it came to this realization that we need a way to make these objective measurements. So Chris really run ran with that. And I think that's really why we're super excited to have him as like our next spot. Cause this set uh, kind of the basis for everything we've done, you know, moving forward in HDR from luck creation to shading and everything to help us validate our process. This It really came out of the work that Chris did to create a set of uh, objective measurement techniques that we can use and we can apply. Outstanding. Well, I see Alex is here and I think Alex is going to drive the conversation today. Alex, you want to grab it, grab the helm? Yeah, so so I think that Michael, it sounds like Michael just uh, just talked through some of that uh, and, and and showed us that. So, uh, do we want to go ahead and, and throw it over to Chris to kind of give us an overview of uh, of what he's uh, what he's has to show us? Perfect. Okay, go ahead, cool. Chris. Uh, well, hello everybody, and uh, thanks for uh, bringing me into this, uh, Mike uh, and Jim. Uh, you know, this all started uh, seven years back in Rio. Um, when we were trying to investigate HDR and we had golden eyes taking a look at, you know, different uh, conversion techniques and we got different opinions from everybody. So we found that subjective assessments of conversions were yielding inconsistent results. And so let's see if we can move this out of the way so you can see the whole thing. Okay. Um, what we're going to cover today is what we eventually uh, came up to. And that was, uh, that we needed some form of objective measurement. And this was standardized in an ITUR report, BT2124. And what it does is it builds a color representation. That's a big container that we can put um, HDR, SDR, um, uh, both in HLG and PQ, the two forms of HDR, into this container that we can then plot so that we can figure out how the conversions are actually working. 
So, you know, when you look at a, a typical single stream workflow, we've got all these conversion points. We've got conversion points coming up from SDR, conversion points going out in both native HDR and converted SDR. That's the derived SDR. So the production is the central portion here where everything is in one format. So we've got to do all these conversions and we want to make sure that all the conversions are correct and they're preserving the original artistic intent. Uh, and, in and, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably back up to something that seems pretty simple to you, but for our viewers, uh, can you explain the difference between the different, uh, the BT2124s, 2120, BT2020, BT, you know, those and what that, what those mean? To, yeah. to some of the viewers that are watching. So BT2020 is is uh, uh, also known as wide color gamut. So it's this larger color space that HDR uses, both HLG and PQ. So it allows us to see a, a greater range of colors. It's not more, uh, more colors at the same time, but actually a wider range of colors. So we can represent things that are closer to what the human eye sees. And would you say that it's like a, it's a bigger box. It's a bigger, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a bigger color box. It's a Go ahead. bigger color box. Now, it's important to separate light from color. So in terms of BT2020, we're talking about the color itself. And the light is represented by the, the higher dynamic range that PQ and HLG gives us. Right. Does that make sense? And it may not be brighter, brighter, but it is a, a wider range and, and more, more delta. Right between, I mean, or or there's finer gradations between that. So you have more detail in the highlights, more detail in the in the in the shadows. Is that would that be correct? So BT twenty twenty would represent the color, not the light. Um, right. HLG and PQ would then represent the light. So that greater right. range from dark to bright and the detail in between. So you know, in a typical SDR TV, you might see the crowd in a stadium show up as as a pure white because it's all clipping because we have no way of describing that additional range um, above a certain brightness and, level. And that can be a real challenge, especially on day games, right? Because you have, you know, in a stadium, you might have half the field in shadow and the other half of the field in sun. And then you end up in kind of a shading, no person's land. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, and it may sound a little counterintuitive, but you want to show that range above, but at the same time, you want to show the range below. So yeah. the shadow detail. You want to, this is one of the things that we can preserve at the same time as we show the brighter elements, we're also showing the darker shadow elements, and that allows us to describe edges. So perceptually, it may look sharper because we can describe that, that darker area simultaneously. Yeah, absolutely. So the brightness portion of it is uh, standardized in BT2100. So it's another ITU standard that describes PQ and HLG. And then the third one that I noted before in this previous slide is BT2124. And that describes the objective color metric measurement. Um, so that's this, this area here. So BT2124, it uses the ITP color space, which... Uh, separates intensity from color, and the color components are the TP portion of that. But it still uses the same color space that regular HDR uses, which is BT2020. But the bottom line is it's just this big space that can represent PQ, HLG, and SDR simultaneously. And because it's doing that simultaneously, it means we can plot it and then analyze what's actually occurring in the conversions. And when you say normalize, this is a matter of converting each one of these to a, a known structure so that they're all kind of in the same space. Is that is that correct? correct. Yes. And so we develop tools um, uh, with some generous contribution from uh, Dolby of the mathematics to normalize in this ITP space. We develop tools that allow us to take these images and given a test pattern, uh, we typically use something from Sarnoff Labs called Yellow Brick Road that allows us to sample different pixel areas um, so that we can actually measure what's happening in the conversion in a very, very large range. 
And I can go into that a little bit uh, later in, in, you know, where we have some examples of what those patterns are and what the plots look like. That's great. So um, when we do these conversions, we're actually, we're typically using LUTs. And LUTs uh, stand for lookup tables. And the lookup tables represent color and light in this 3D cube so that we can map coordinates of both color and light. And when we do the conversion, it's just actually moving those points. So when you see those points move, they're moving from the original position, which is equidistant. And so when they're, when they're equidistant and they're filling that square, it, the color that went in is the same color that goes out, right? It's, it's like it's, there's, no, there's no adjustment to it. Um, and as you move that, it's changing, it's warping what comes in to, to what goes out. Is that, would that be accurate? That is absolutely correct. And, and thank mm -hmm. you for, you know, clarifying and giving it more detail. It, I always think of it as like a curve, except in 3D. <laughs> you know, like it's, you know, like yeah. the curves that we're used to looking at, but it's a 3D curve. And we're moving those, those, those transforms. And how many points do you typically use for these? Uh, so for... Um, live, we're only capable of doing 33 points. In in cinema, they often go higher. Um, but because we have to do this on the fly, uh, we have we use 33 point LUTs, but we also very specifically use um, something called tetrahedral interpolation because you can see space in between these points. And there aren't points that represent absolutely every every level of light and color. So we've got to interpolate the in-between positions. And the interpolation is very, very important. Um, we require that our live converters use tetrahedral interpolation. And at this point, um, almost everybody um, is using that. And certainly everybody is that uh, um, that we use from Grass Valley to Cobalt to Everts to Aja. They're all using tetrahedral interpolation. And this is essentially how do you get from one, you have 33 points that are the anchors that tell you where you're pushing that color, but then there's little curves between those points that it has to, because that, that represents the rest of the color. So it's how that curve, how that slope works and how it's interpolated between the, the, the different points around it. Is that, between, would that be between accurate? Between the dots, yes. Yeah. Between the represented dots that are in the LUT that represent the exact explicit points in the, in the conversion. So you have to you have to make a guess of what's in between, and there are better algorithms, um, interpolation modes that allow us to guess where it should be. And tetrahedral happens to be uh, really really nice, um, specifically for the highlight compression. If you don't use tetrahedral interpolation, we see it sawtooth in the knee at the very mm. top where we're compressing a lot of highlights. So you have to use tetrahedral interpolation. Otherwise, you'll see visible banding in, in the upper, you know, in the brighter areas. Right. So um, when we map to ITP, we're basically taking these red cones that uh, capture different wavelengths of light, and we're reinterpolating it into this new color space where intensity represents the the light, and then these CT and CP components basically represent all the other colors, uh, all the colors. So if you think about, you know, when you were going through your uh, geometry classes and you had an XY plot, uh, we plot TP and we can see what the colors are actually doing um, in their 2D space. Now, how does this, how is this similar? Is it similar at all to, to something like YUV? So YUV and, you know, if, if we get more specific to what's in broadcast video, it's YCBCR, where Y is the light component. Right. Um, there is um, some element of color in the Y, unfortunately, because of artifacts in the way YCBCR works. So this, so ICTCP separates light and color um, um, more accurately. So we do a plot here. Um, objectively, we can get a better measure using ICTCP. And it, some may be familiar with Dolby Vision um, in its uh, first form, which used Profile 5. And Profile 5 actually uses a form of ICTCP. Um, in the actual broadcast, so on Apple TVs, uh, they're actually using a form of ICTCP um, in their actual 
VOD content. So when we look at um, these different spaces, there's a huge difference between um, uh, the the uh, amount of dynamic range and color that's contained in each of these. So this is a 3D representation of SDR uh, video. Um, and then HLG, which is a little larger, and then PQ. Um, HLG normalized can go up to about 1,000 nits, and then PQ goes up to about uh, 10,000. Um, the interesting thing is that HLG and SDR are both relative um, uh, formats. That means that they scale into the capability of the display itself. So if you have a brighter display, you could have brighter content. They've limited, limited it for SDR because SDR really wasn't designed for high dynamic range. So a typical reference display is at 100 nits. Consumer displays are at 200. And we optimize our conversions for 200 nits um, because... Uh, we want to optimize our images for what consumers use today and really for the past 15 years. And that's the advantage, right, of the HLG curve is that it's so similar to the to the SDR curve that you can watch an HDR, HLG on an SDR TV and it's still going to look acceptable. I mean, wasn't that the kind of the idea behind that design? Yeah, that was the original premise, but that was when the color space uh, they thought they were going to use was going to be 709. And what ended up happening was uh, that um, uh, uh, most HDR movies uh, uh, by default became BT 2020. So if you put an HLG movie onto an SDR display, you are going to have subtle hue shifts. Right. because you have a different color space. But yeah, that was a general concept because the gamma curve was very similar up to 75% of the HLG signal level. And then the last 25% was preserved for highlights. So when you look at HLG on an SDR display, it's going to be about 25% darker. Oh, Actually, I'm sorry, about 50% darker because at 75%, the light level is actually half because of the gamma curve. So... um you can get an acceptable image for shot selection, but we wouldn't want the HLG image to go to the wrong display on an SDR display, but you can do shot selection with it. Now, that we, we talked about this a little bit in the last, but since you're here, I'll ask you, you've chosen, so your pipeline is built on HLG, even though PQ has a, a greater range. Why did you make the HLG choice? So actually we're a hybrid. So in production, uh, we use HLG for that very same thing we talked about before, that there's some level of backward compatibility. Mm -hmm. And the trucks typically had older displays. So we needed to have some way for production teams to make shot selection and have some sort of acceptable image on their SDR displays. There weren't any HLG displays at, at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we take HLG from production and we convert it to PQ for the last leg to the consumer. And we do that because PQ has an absolute representation. And that means that the graphic white will end up at about the same place uh, um, it was in the original production where they had a thousand nit uh, HLG display. Um, I, I mentioned I know, before I think, that- I think that's a great question you had, Alex. And then uh, we have an upcoming conversation, I think scheduled to talk about LUTs and the development and the pipeline. Perfect. And I think that's a really like, how that whole thing works from you know camera to consumer is a great thing that hopefully we could get Chris back to like talk through a lot of that decision making. Yeah, that no, sounds great. Yeah, so that is that is a pretty deep subject, um, and you know we thought long and hard about how to do this. And bottom line was we wanted to preserve the original artistic intent all the way to the consumer. And maybe we can have a deeper discussion on can't, that. Can't so wait I for that conversation. Cause you know, I, I've had to deal with live as well. And I chose PQ as the pipeline and it, it'll be interesting to see. And, but I'm open to changing it, <laughs> to, 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 you know, to, to, to look at it, but it's, but it was, um, it's, it's a, uh, it's a fa I find that to be a fascinating set of choices. So. Yeah, and the other thing is, um, uh, this is really impacted by what kind of camera you use. A broadcast camera mm -hmm. is typically not, uh, or you know, some cameras aren't capable of more than 102 percent of uh, the dynamic range in right. uh, so given HLG. But a cinema camera can go uh, can uh, re uh, capture a much wider dynamic range. So right. if you're using a cinema camera, then 
you could shoot and produce in PQ right. and go all the way to the consumer with PQ. But in the case of live cameras, it's not that easy. So for for, a, for an, another discussion, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, yeah so that, that's a preview yeah. for everybody who's watching that we're, we're going to keep on having these conversations and that we'll, we'll get to that one as we as we move forward. Yeah. And I think, Chris, as you start on this slide, my suggestion here, start with, ironically, the smaller picture of YBR before in like set up like we had to create before you talk about how we test and plot, talk about what YBR is for us. Sure. OK, so um, down here is what Michael is calling YBR, and it stands for Yellow Brick Road. And the cool thing about Yellow Brick Road is it represents the color primary. So you see red, green, and, and uh, red, green, and blue, but you also see the compound colors. The com compound colors are the combined colors, um, cyan and magenta, yellow, um, orange. And um, so we can test all of those different colors um, but we can also uh, test the luminance increase as we go from left to right. So we're we're testing the color range, but we're also testing the light range all the way up to, in this case on HLG, uh, to about um, 1810 uh, nits with, if you use the full range, um, including over range, that's above 100% signal level. We can preserve a little bit more range. Yellow Brick Road gives us the ability to do that. So, um, Michael, did you want to uh, add anything on top of that? No, I think you set that up well because now I think it will make sense. What now you can walk through what how you can make that plot in the picture above it. Yeah. So back in the beginning, when we um, first started thinking about doing this. Literally, we got the mathematics into a spreadsheet and we could, you know, test about 20 points manually because we'd have to grab the numbers from the movie and then paste them into a spreadsheet and then get the value and then plot it. So we found this um, application called Voya that actually allows you to sample the the um, uh, uh, the code values within a movie's pixel location. And. Um, they added a plugin architecture. And so we paid the developer to add, uh, to create a plugin, which takes pixel positions. So these are XY pixel positions within the yellow brick road, and there are over 500 of them. Um, and it will automatically grab the code values from all of those positions. And then if you look down here where treat input as, we can actually have it translate from the format of the original movie into that ITP space that I mentioned earlier. So this is how we normalize everything for the plot. And it will actually do a plot within the application uh, for a basic TP um, uh, plot, which will only show color, but I'm gonna show you how we look at light and color later. And it can actually look at multiple movies together so you can see source and destination or the input to the movie as reference, and then the output, which is conversion. And in this drawing, the blue dots represent the source, and then the red dots represent the conversion the conversion through the LUT. And in this case, we're actually converting between HLG to PQ. So this is what we would do for our transmission system going from production into transmission. And we see a really clean, accurate conversion from uh, source to destination. Um, the plugin has a lot of variability where we can set the maximum luminance as we're doing a conversion. Um, and this treat input as will allow us to select between SDR, HLG, PQ as the source. And in the case of SDR, it'll also allow us to set the luminance, the max luminance as well, so that we can see what uh, will happen visually on a reference display versus a consumer display. Mike, did you want to add anything else uh, to that? Yeah, I was going to say, no, I think that was excellent because that's really set stuff like, so this now, you have that source material and whether you're transitioning between, you know, as Chris said here, between HLG and PQ or SDR to HLG or SDR to PQ, or even 
just HLG to HLG. We we discovered that we could use the same methodology to make sure what you put into a device is what you get out of the device. So like this, this became infinitely usable for us. And I think what became even more interesting is where what Chris is about to show us next is then how you, you know, right? Because this just looks like a graph, right? And it, we can kind of get where it is. But then Chris came up with a way to quantify it. So well, and, and and so the and the and like the um uh we use a much cruder version of this, which is using a, a, a DSD, you know, chroma demand chart where we're, you know, like we're measuring those, but this is a much higher resolution version of that where you have just a lot more data, right? And this, and now is this a, is if, if this is coming from Sarnoff, is this a monitor that's actually displaying this? No, this is an actual test pattern. So we can quantify um, uh, from a file level, whether the conversion ah. is Got it. Because we really want to know from a file level mm -hmm. so that if a camera is going in there, whatever level uh, should be converted, it's an absolute number that is uh, that, right. that's being represented. And the only way to do that is is from a file because there's so much interpolation. Inside well, what's outputting that file? Is it their hardware or is it a is it a uh, when you're outputting because you're representing a camera like a camera is going to come in? What is pushing that signal out or you know as far well, as that goes? What we could have any multitude of players that'll play an MOV or MX. Got it. So you, right? Yeah. So we'll play it out. We'll pass it through the conversion system, or if it's file level, you know, we can test it in DaVinci Resolve. We can test it right. in Adobe uh, Premiere. Um, in fact, we have in every single um, editing application. That's the interesting thing. There, the, there is no real LUT standard, so there are different LUTs. Uh, for DaVinci Resolve versus Adobe Premiere. Right. Um, Final Cut uses Adobe Premiere format uh, cube LUTs. And then for Avid, you actually have to use a CLF LUT, which is a common LUT format developed by Ampus. But all these are available on GitHub. We've built them. Uh, they do this. They make the same conversion. It's just a different LUT uh, format. Right. So maybe that's another uh another discussion about yeah, yeah, yeah. LUTs. Absolutely. Um, Alex, we're wanting to your thing about the cameras. The thing we discovered about each one of the different camera manufacturers does something slightly different. So when we shot something like a Dumont chart, some camera manufacturers followed 2020 primaries and didn't do it. Some camera factory, manufacturers sque skewed the colors back towards 709 primaries. Yep. So we, we kind of made the decision that the that's a creative decision right and you buy camera x first camera y and its handles and how it works but we need to ensure that once it came out of the camera and that artistic look that was created by you know whoever was shading the cameras or a dit in that workflow that it maintained that consistency that we did yep. not color that look downstream which is how we ended up like we test on immediately from the other side of that Right. Yeah, and specifically, um, what he was talking about is the SDR output from the camera's CCU. So if the camera is HDR, but it also has an SDR output, we found that we do not want to use the SDR output from the CCU because it's skewing towards 709 primaries immediately. In other words, it's changing the original color when it doesn't have to when it's within the BT709 triangle. So right. it's within that space. Yep, absolutely. So um, this is what Michael was mentioning before. And what uh, I guess I didn't mention is that, and uh, I'm going to jump back to this for a section, it, it, for a second. If you hit save as, um, this application will actually save a CSV, um, a comma separated uh, 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 text file with um, the ITP values um, and the YUV, the YCBCR code values, so that we can then plot them in more sophisticated ways. So this is that and, same. And just for just for the viewers, this is from offminer.de. This is the Voya, the raw video sequence player. Is that what you're using? Correct. Okay, yes, right. and it's a color metric plugin mm -hmm. um, that is a you know it's a separate purchase. Right. Um, we've, uh, allowed the developer to sell this after we developed, uh, uh paid for the development on, oh, on great. the plugin, but it's, it's ultra cheap, uh, yeah. considering what it does. Yeah. Um, so this is that same, uh, HLG to PQ conversion. So we see the, 
the uh, the red aligning with, with the with the blue very accurately. Um, and then we have different things represented here, which give us more information. So if there is a hue shift, this will actually quantify what the hue shift is. And, and you can see the that there are very small U shifts here. And in the case of ITP, any value over one is a noticeable difference. So we're under one, and therefore nobody's going to notice that, you know, this interpolation difference from the LUT conversion. And Chris, is that known as JND? JND. Yep. Just noticeable what? difference. Um, so on the bottom here, we're plotting the intensity or the light tracking. And then at the very top here, this is a sum of all parts. This is light and color um, and the difference. So we can see if there's any problem between light and color uh, that's impacting the conversion. So this HLG conversion is very, very good. And just for people, to, when you say difference, what, what's happening here is this graph, you're literally taking a column and subtracting it from the other column, you know, and then, and then, and then showing the difference between the two. And then that's what's going into this graph. Is that basically how that's, I mean, because you're getting CSVs out, right? And you're using those to analyze yeah, it. There's a little bit more math uh, than just a simple difference. Right. Uh, but if you download the spreadsheet um, from uh, GitHub, uh, right. All of those formulas are still there and Got available it. for anybody to investigate. And in fact, uh, there will probably be a commercial product very soon that represents some of this. We can't really announce it yet, but right. um, the good news is it will be out there eventually. And and so we won't have to do this as a semi-manual process. We've automated some of it, but we can't automate all of it. Right, right. Makes sense. So then we've added um, plotting of chroma difference, and then intensity difference. So this is intensity tracking, but this will show us difference. And this uh, is the difference between the two different conversions. So the, you have your 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 base conversion and what you're converting to and just seeing how, how, how accurately you hit the target. Correct. And as Michael mentioned before, um, you know, this isn't just for the conversions, it's also for simple pass-through. And we found so many devices yeah. that were supposed to be passing signals through in HDR, and they were affecting uh, the, the visual. And this is a good example of it on this next slide. And this is actually a broadcast legalizer, and it was affecting cyan and blue individually and looking pretty good on the rest of it. Right. Uh, a lot of these devices were designed for SDR, and the manufacturers say, well, they'll pass HDR. They may not signal correctly, but they should pass it. But often they don't. Yep. And if you look at the TP plot, you'll see that there's a lot more subtle stuff happening, a lot of subtle hue shifts around cyan, and a little bit happening in magenta uh, in, in just one point. It's very bizarre. So... Yeah. Chris, do you think we had some issues with some of our SDR gear? We just didn't have a way to test it or quantify it? I would almost guarantee it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so, why these, I mean, I think a lot of people wonder why so many of us are so obsessed with scopes and charts and everything else. And a lot of times you just can't, you, you, you know, it's trust but verify, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like they, they'll tell you that, that it's there, but, but there's so many places that we find, whether it's audio sync or whether it's, uh, color or anything else that 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 no matter what they say, we're not getting. You know, you have to see what the hardware is actually doing. Yeah, and the hard part is that we really have not been provided the tools to date right. um, to do more sophisticated measurements. So, uh, in the case of um, uh, some of the metrics like PSNR, if anybody's familiar with PSNR, or the one that. Uh, um, uh, VMAF, I think, from Netflix. Those are all Luma-based. They don't uh, take color into uh, consideration. Um, so we're dropping the ball on a big part of what we should be um, testing. It's not just about uh, compression artifacts. It should also be about accurate reproduction uh, for preservation of, of artistic uh, intent. Because hmm. we're all passionate about preserving, you know, the, the beautiful pictures that we create. I, would, I guess I would say, I don't think we're dropping the ball anymore, Chris. With your work, like we now have a way to do it. So yeah. I think we were, but now going forward, like we, we have a way to do it. So 
Uh, and can I, I'm going to jump in here and say, you know, where this comes into play in the real world in the case of Thursday Night Football last season is when you've got team logos that are uh, the graphics department are taking the team logos that were created in an sRGB space that came from the teams and they're making them into overlay graphics. Those graphics get converted from sRGB 709 to into the 2020 HLG space and then back to 709 SDR. Those subtle hues in like the Kansas City Chiefs red has to maintain all the way through or else people notice, hey, the logo changed color. And we had uh, uh, instances of lots of, uh, of equipment that were ha causing these little errors that would compound as it passes through the system and no real way to, to quantify it until we brought you know, Chris in and, and gave him samples of each step of the way and were able to figure out, target the uh, offending equipment that was doing a improper color space conversion or improper YCBCR to, to RGB conversion, et cetera. Do you, do you have a problem with, if for some of the teams, they've made changes to, for instance, their, their uniforms for an SDR world, um, do you see that, like, so I would point out the Dallas Cowboys specifically, their pants are, are built for SDR cameras. <laughs> like, is that a, has that shown up as an issue when you, when you get those? Cause they're, when you see them in person, I mean, when you see them on air, they seem silver. When you see them in person, they seem green, <laughs> you know, so, or bluish green. Um, is, is that something that has been a challenge that things, things have been built for something that you're now doing something different? I, I think that, and I think also the teams have got subtle different uh, uniforms, whether they're home or away. I've noticed uh, right. just in last season some subtle changes, and stadium lighting has a big effect on that. And uh, I've seen the video guys shading cameras going, well, what's this supposed to be? Right. And they're, that's just you know, nothing to do with HDR. They're just trying to make you know make their, their teams happy. Right. So, yeah, it's a it's – a, and, then, and then, of course, you, you also add into sponsor logos. An instance last season was – um, Little Caesars, they have a very interesting color orange in their logo, and it seems to translate uh, differently through different pieces of gear. And I think, you know, when you get into saturated colors that originate in one f source, end up in another, Chris can jump on that. Um, the, the challenges we've had just oh, maintaining yeah. intended look. And I think that speaks to the the challenge that we kind of took for granted in the SDR space that it all kind of worked and it was close enough and there was enough wiggle room. But as we've right. gotten the HDR and every and the precision of everything's come up, it's really making sure the entire pipeline lines up. And like we just talked about, it's like how a camera represents a color it sees on the field. Does that match what like Jim brought up that comes out of a you know the say the Kansas Chief red? may come out of three or four different devices that are part of the production and it needs to be consistent between all of those devices on the file base world because uh, if it's not consistent between those there's no way it can match what the cameras are doing and right you, you it's like all the different pieces that bring a show together really need to be evaluated as you do this and it's really because we now have the tools and we're paying a lot more attention to it yeah. i think chris has here this a great example of something we just found. Do you want to walk us through this, Chris? Yeah, this is a strange one. This is just supposed to be uh, HLG pass through. Um, and if you look at the blue line, that's the the original, and the red is the conversion. And so uh, the fact that the red is away from the blue means we're actually changing the colors. We're changing the reds. We're changing, uh, you know, uh, the the greens uh, in the darker areas. And right. so, so it's so important to test every device. This uh, this is just a, supposed to be simple pass through. Right, that was supposed to be just in and out. It's like the loop through almost, not well, maybe, or or pass through the equipment. And it's it's still the, the circuitry isn't representing that correctly. Chris, without outing without outing the manufacturer here, can you kind of describe what went wrong here, or what where the error was made in that device? Well, so here's here's the thing. Uh, this technique allows us to find out that there's something wrong, but we can't go back into the code of the manufacturer um, uh, and and tell them where they made the mistake. So what we do is we find the mistake, we go back to the manufacturer, and they've got to go dig into their code and figure out what went wrong. Right. Because I, I will share a quick story. There was a, a certain capture card that was using a, um, a transform to get from uh, RGB, uh, sRGB back to Rec 709 or Rec 2020. And we found in their kind of config file that they were using a 601 transform, not a 709 transform in their workflow. And 
they had been using that for years and nobody's noticed it until we start working in a 2020 space. And I think a lot of it has to do with uh, the, 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 we saw the same code values that we had for a 709 that we do for a 2020. So now every little step is a bigger, bigger result in the color change. So we've had all these subtle errors in the SDR 709 that you, that you couldn't perceive, but they were there. But now that's being exaggerated because now we're, we got a bigger bucket represented by the same code values. That yeah, a, yeah, that's correct. That's a really good uh, point. Maybe I can bring a little bit more detail into that. So the LUTs actually process an RGB. Um, and the incoming video, unless it's a graphic, is typically YCBCR. You've got to convert between YCBCR and RGB, and what describes uh, how to do that correctly is something called the matrix coefficients. And they're built into the signaling of in the SDI stream to tell the LUT what the source is so that it makes an a accurate conversion. If it doesn't use the right matrix coefficients to get to RGB, then you'll have errors in, in pass-through. And, and what's the difference between the matrix coefficient and the LUT itself? So the matrix coefficient is, is just uh, telling the uh, equipment manufacturer, the software, um, what color space is being used and what equation to use to convert between YCBCR and RGB. So there's another document called H.273, and I'm getting way too much into the weeds, but that signals what matrix should be used in order to do the YCBCR to RGB uh, conversion. So you've got to do the right conversion, and many software packages and many hardware devices and every LUT conversion uses RGB space in the case of our LUTs. So that broadcast video that's in YCBCR has to be converted to RGB, but it's got to use the right matrix coefficients in order to get there. Right. Now, now, Chris, can I, I, I've, in the middle of the night, I thought of this, the conversion, I was trying to wrap my head around, and it's taken me a lot, many years to, to even understand this. You guys are so smart and it's, it still hurts my brain. The, uh, the idea I came up with is, is if you convert, um, you know, uh, inch and feet and inches to metric, you know, fractions to metric, and then back to inches and fractions, you don't get the same thing. The conversion, if you if you convert a bunch of in, feet, inches, and fractions into metric, do some math, do some transformation, and convert it back, you don't get the exact same value. You always lose something every time you 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 do something like that. Is that true for the the, the RGB YCBCR conversion back and forth? Yeah, you're bringing up so many good points. So, um, you know, it, it's it it's never uh, perfect when you're converting from one to the other. Um, and it also has to do with a mathematical precision uh, that's being applied. Right, because during... I mean, essentially you're talking about, in addition to the calculations, is round off errors, right? I mean, that's yeah, the... So, so there are round off errors that may occur. So in the case of Voya, we use, we use very high precision uh, mathematics um, for for the conversion from YCBCR to, um, uh, to ITP. Um, and we found that out very, very quickly that we had to do that um, because we were getting the wrong, uh, uh, the wrong uh, uh, incorrect plots. Um, so that's a very good point. Another and additional it, point. It's also a sort of a form of compression, right? Going from RGB to ICBCR. You're, you're because of the, uh, uh, now this I'm going to get myself in trouble. The, the 444 and 422 kind of idea, does that come into play? when you go back yeah. and forth between those formats? You're bringing up all the good points. So uh, there is subsampling um, that also is introduced. So if you're compressing to HEVC or AVC, uh, it uses 420 uh, color subsampling. Broadcast video uses 422. Graphics uses 444. And I don't think I'm going to dive too deeply into how subsampling works in this in this call. But I think the point is, is that the the tools that you just tried, demonstrated for us uh, gives us a way to quantify the resulting of all those conversions that we've never really had a an easy way to see before. There's well, it's hard to see this on a scope. And I think the thing that I'm waveform. still trying to wrap my head around a little bit is when you're validating the cameras, what are you putting in front of the camera to validate the signal, um, you know, for uh, that conversion? So what you're doing is you're validating a Th that if you take a valid signal with proper code values, that it is con being converted correctly. So if you do that, a camera 
if it's producing a signal that's that's correct, should uh, be converted correctly. So all we're really testing is correct conversion or pass through, but it doesn't. But that signal. camera itself. So what and what and so the what LUT does the camera have on it? I mean, what is it? Is it going log or is it its base output or so, is it HLG or you know so on and so forth? Yeah. So different productions use uh, different. Uh, video formats and all of the productions that we do in HDR, uh, they typically use HLG right now, but um, BT Sports might use S-Log3, um, and uh, that has a different black value. Um, some productions, uh, although rare right now, might use PQ in their live productions. Uh, cinema uses PQ uh, uh, quite a bit, or they might use Log. Um, but our live linear productions that we're talking about here, um, uh, the majority of them are using HLG natively out of the camera. We ignore the SDR CCU output because we don't think that that conversion is um, what we desire. Um, for a, a bunch of reasons, the, the one that uh, Michael was talking about where the colors uh, primary primaries are skewed very immediately to 709, so we are not reproducing uh, the best colors coming out of the uh, out of the camera after the conversion. But another one is the sophistication of the knee. So how we preserve the highlights. So right. that's the light information. And our LUT does a really, really good job of highlight and gamut compression. And the camera CCU just can't. So right. we actually uh, effectively, we think, produce better SDR because of the quality of our um, compression knee. Yeah, Alex, I think what you're asking is, and how do we set cameras up in this environment? And I think, you know, the first thing they have to do, make sure your pipeline, your monitoring flow from the output of the CCU or output of the camera all the way through to the monitor where the shader is, has to be you know, quantified and qualified as pure before you can start looking at a camera. And what's missing, we have not seen a, a wide a wide gamut color chart. I've not seen an HDR color chart. I've right. seen some contrast uh, charts to look at that just kind of show you absolute white and black. But there, there's a there's a definite lack in the field of a of a chroma demand or something that's optimized for HLG Rec 2020. Right. So there is a uh, Vista um, chart that has wide color gamut inks, um, and we've used it in some of the Olympics uh, before. Um, but there are aren't inks that I know of that represent enough uh, or charts that that have inks. Uh, that represents enough of the wide color gamut range. And um, and, DS, and have you used the like DSC has its own uh, projection systems as well. So as opposed to a a, a, a ink chart, they have uh, actual projection. Have you used those at all? I have not myself, but maybe Mike. Uh, I haven't, and I'll be honest. We kind of like we've really focused on the step right after the cameras because the cameras right. do their own thing and we've kind of let the artistic vision of whoever's shading the camera create right. and really worked hard to ensure that it flows through the whole pipeline and through like in that when we have the luck conversation how it gets represented between the different mediums and transfers between the mediums that makes sense because yeah. like i think there's just like there's artistic intent, like we like to say, involved. And sometimes like that's not necessarily the role for the engineers to play in. I, I like to say we like to build that box mm -hmm. to keep like there was a box. We know how to work around work in 709. And, and the key is just having box. certainty from the time the camera hits the system, having certainty that it's going to remain whatever that was until it shows up on someone's TV is the is the key to that pipeline. That makes sense. Because yeah. here's an example that I had on a on a production last year was that the uh, the video shader was not it was not used to and experienced in working in HLG. He's worked in cinema. He's worked in a lot of things. The engineers that set up the room were not that that experienced, and the um, the monitor was not set up correctly for HLG. It did not have the right color transfer and EOTF settings in the monitor. So he was shading a camera to make it look good to his eye. And he made a good looking image on that monitor, but it didn't right. work anywhere else in the plant and it didn't work in the facility. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> and his his decades of of looking at a waveform vector scope were tricking his brain because he's you know done this conversion in his head of when he sees something at 65 IRE, he knows where that is visually. Yep. Where a lot of these guys don't even need to see a monitor, they can shade by a scope. Right. And because those code values do not are, are a different mapping now, 
Um, mm-hmm. All bets are off on that. So all these uh, video guys that have literally decades of experience have to relearn uh, what they're used to seeing in the scope. And it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. Uh, on, on Thursday night, we put two scopes side by side. We had one scope set as um, you know, 709 SDR and the other one is HLG, you know, 2020. And it took them weeks and, and weeks. And you have to of, get used to it because it looks way lower than it should be, you know, when you're, right. when it's going through the H. Yeah. yeah right. And, and they're used to, you know, these guys that have been in the same sports over and over, they know when they camera zooms into the, you know, Dodger stadium, the Dodger blue, they know where that hits on the vector scope right. and it doesn't hit there now. It's in a different spot. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I think we're running out of time and we've got questions. So let's go ahead and throw a couple questions in here. First one in from uh, Brad Woodall in Boston, Massachusetts. Brad wants to know, with different networks choosing to use different LUT combinations, will sharing HDR content between networks be a problem? You want to kick that off, Michael? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, I think that if they're HDR to HDR, I think it's this, you know, each network, each creative can make their own decisions. And I think that even if you look today, like uh, a game on one network looks different than a game on another network. And that's yeah. kind of part of how it is from uh, if you're sharing content and the storytelling downstream. I think a network needs to make that decision for themselves on how all their shows integrate, you know, with each other and with other shows and then all the devices. How many live, how many networks are doing live HDR right uh, now? To, to our knowledge, um, NBC, uh, Fox, I think ESPN did some football last year and some other events. And I think that, you know, I think we'll likely see CBS has Super Bowl this year. I'm willing to bet we'll see them get in the fray too this year. Right. Uh, the good news, oh, go, go ahead, Chris. The good news is that the majority of uh, on the U.S. side transmit in PQ, uh, and that's from from our side of it. So, and they also use consistent LUT. So it's so there's some there's some documentation on this in the ITU document BT twenty four oh eight, which actually describes the two goals, and those are the two common methods that are used uh, right now. And I think we're seeing there's a bunch of regional channels that are also doing consistent HDR productions for you know home shows. Right. I'm not sure about away shows. I think the, I think the problem that's going to come into play is because I think my understanding is that the NBC philosophy is a match set of LUTs to go from SDR to HDR is kind of a complement to the HDR back to SDR LUT. So if you've got archive footage or or graphics or things that are started original in in 709 SDR, that they maintain that look across. My my concern is that when you something that NBC has created in the HDR space gets downloaded by another network, you're going to have some subtle changes there that could be an issue. I don't think it'll be an issue for the HDR originated sources, but something that's been converted by somebody else and then a different person does the conversion back to SDR is where we're going to see some of these errors. Well, and then also you have a lot of footage that may never see, uh, never go out to a network, you know, like, so MLS is going to be, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think it's an HDR this year, but probably next year it will be in. And, um, the, uh, and so you have, you know, that's never going through any of the other pipes. Like it's just going straight from, I mean, maybe it is, I guess it's, they're making it available to broadcasters, but it sounds like, you know, you know, kind of Apple owns that, that pipeline. So, and I think the streamers are going to want to have their own kind of secret sauce so that they have their own look because they, you know, control the pipeline all the way to the user. (laughs) I'm sorry with the compression with Netflix, it, it is sauce. It is, there's a lot of. A lot of sauce there. Um, uh, <laughs> next next question. Next question from Douglas Carmichael. When do you think we'll see HDR production trickle down to the semi-professional, like the Black Magic design market? Good, Michael. Yeah, I, actually, I think we're there. I think Jim can probably talk to this the best. I think that most of the products that we're seeing, whether it's you know the Black Magic, you know tech stack or the Aja tech stack, like oh. I, it's kind of hard these days to find a new product that doesn't do HDR. I mean, Jim, do you agree? Yeah, the, the, I'm seeing seeing more and more of the tools uh, pop up, and but you, I don't think the the choices are as broad. I think they're gonna those manufacturers are gonna limit to you what you can and can't do. But the automatic uh, treatment of that, the automatic, you know, Black Magic is getting really good on the metadata. They're um, Video Assist does a really good job of identifying uh, source material and recording the flags and playing back properly. It's uh, it's going to be here sooner. The, the you know it's I find it most interesting is how far Apple is as far as their um, you know something as stupid as 
nextdoor.com, which I, because of the HOA I live in, is watching uh, the community here. But people are posting, you know, videos of the coyotes running down the neighborhood and they're in HDR and the HDR shows up on the nextdoor.com. I actually see the. If you're in Safari. <laughs> if you're in, if you're in Safari. Uh, no, um, Chrome. Is it showing up in Chrome? Okay. Google for, Chrome. On for a long time, we had we had a hard time getting the HDR to show up in Chrome. So so it was uh, the, the Chrome browser was you know that's yeah Apple because Apple committed to Dolby or you know Dolby Vision five years ago. So it's right. like every device has has the and ability HDR. to do that. HDR. Right Which and HDR. Yeah. yeah, and it it kills me because I can take pictures on my phone and and look at it. And all my Apple products is fine. I bring it into anything Adobe and it just flattens out and it's gone and I. No matter what I do, I can't see it again. I had to build an HDR app. And the first thing I said is, we'll just build it on the Apple platform first. <laughs> Let's just get this to work. And then we'll deal with the other stuff because it's so, such a mess. Um, uh, ne next question. Bill Davis from San Diego and here in our panel asks, with the work your team is doing, might we see a future where managing color and luminance factors across a typical workflow pipeline gets simpler in the future? Uh, I might be able to take that. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. So if you uh, buy an, uh, uh, an Aja color box right now, they've actually converted the mathematics for our uh, LUTs, uh, for the engine that created our LUTs, it's called the Orion engine. So you can actually tweak in your own values um, and make your own conversion strategy for where the you know white level is going to be, how the compression occurs. So that's all you know via a simple GUI with sliders. Um, so it's become much easier to do quality conversion and basically build your own look if you wanted to. Yeah. And the, the you know, one of the things we've got, we we're using the FSHDR and we've actually built an entire, uh, separate web interface to control all of those sliders so that we can do it per person, you know, that's in, the, in here, uh, as we, as we go through it. So the, you know, and there, I think, uh, AJA is a adding a couple of things for us to, to make that a little bit smoother, but it should be, uh, but it's 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 definitely come a long way. Go ahead, Michael. Did you have something to add there? Okay. Next question from Douglas Carmichael again. What roles would a box like the FSHDR play within a mixed SDR HDR workflow? Let's go, ahead, Michael. Yeah, I would say I'll, I'll take that. I think that that's a great box to do any of that conversion from HDR to SDR. You could even do like there's some ability to paint. So I think that honestly that box traditionally has been our Swiss army knife in a lot of productions that we need to get from one thing to another. It has a whole lot of audio capabilities in it. And I will say that we have watched the evolution of the software in that box. And it's just gotten from the first day where it was like, you had, like Chris was mentioning, you had to get a whole bunch of matrix. You had to get stuff set. Otherwise what you put in and it wasn't calculating correct. They've really done a really good job of making it more accessible and easier to use just to, you know, Pick the say you want the NBC LUTs. That's in a drop down. You didn't the BBC LUTs are in a drop down. There's it's there. It works and it's very easy. Next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana has a question. Could there be any sort of Pantone matching for HDR that does analysis of the final result and thus forces some standardization of the processing workflows? I think that's the goal of this whole process. So hopefully we can evangelize it more um, so that it becomes automatic. Absolutely. Next question. Eduardo Augustine from Panama. Any idea on YouTube doing HDR for football and a higher bit rate for UHD? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I think just to remember here, like YouTube has, you know, that they're a distributor, so they're not actually doing the production. So to make any decision about production, it's got to, you know, and just for it to get to distribution, it has to start in production. And especially on, you know, broadcast events that have affiliates, there are, there's politics and stuff involved that go beyond what's technically capable. So I don't know that, you know, I think we're all hoping that we see more and more HDR content via the OTT platforms, but we just need to be cognizant of, you know, how it starts in the production environment. Next question. Bill Davis, San Diego. Might it be time for new scope standards, waveform, monitor, vector, et cetera, to help producers get comfortable in this new world, or are we are traditional measurements tools like the waveform, monitor, vector, parades, et cetera, still work? Good, Michael. Yeah, I think I would say that like hopefully the this very detailed process that Chris walked us through today gets done and tools get validated and fixed. And 
I guess my opinion is I don't know that we need to use this on a daily basis where waveforms and vector scopes may continue to fill that daily, you know, in and out. Are my where are my levels? How am I shading colors? I guess Chris and Jim, I mean, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I'd like to qualify one thing. I think there is value in the TP in a TP vector scope because one of the things about ITP is it's got something called constant hue. So that the hue is very accurately represented. So if you have a hue shift, you can easily see it much easier than with YCBCR and a YCBCR or a CBCR vector scope. So that's what we're encouraging some manufacturers to put into their scopes right now, a TP vector scope. And let's go to the last question. Last one in from Douglas Carmichael. You mentioned Blackmagic design cameras are HDR savvy. You think we'll see an HDR A10? Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I think uh, it's just a matter of them, uh, a firmware update and all that stuff turns on because the hardware is in place uh, already it's, with that stuff. It's there. Like the the Constellation <laughs> will do it sometimes, just not when you know what, you just don't know when it's actually going to do it. So, uh, but yes. hey, I, I don't, you know, from what my experience with what Grass Valley uh, has done with their switchers in, uh, in HDR and trying to automatically flag incoming video and the problems we had with that, I, you know, it's it's imminent with uh, with black magic. Our I big guess, request is is not. I don't even need a button. Just give me an API call that just tells the tells the switcher you're in 2020. Like don't change this. Don't just just make everything 2020. But we yeah. Go ahead, I'd like a status that tells me what all the incoming uh, format is of each of the yeah. inputs that it's converting to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. So uh, if you look at the specs on some of the black magic products, some of them don't say they support BT2020. So even if they're passing it, do we know if they're passing it correctly? I think, uh, uh, like uh, uh, Jim said, wait for a firmware upgrade and and otherwise maybe it's doing some filtering, but I haven't tested all of these devices to make sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just really such a great hour. Um, Chris, uh, Jim, and Michael, just um, thank you so much for your time. Or we're, I get really excited when you guys are going to come on <laughs> to talk about some stuff. This is the opportunity. Yeah, we're Great. really excited about it. And we're really, you know, I'm I'm a, obviously a big fan of, of HDR production. And uh, it's such an honor to have you guys here and really help us figure it out on our end. And hopefully we can help by doing more testing and and uh, spreading the spreading the good word. I'm trying to, trying to get this thing moving. I'm excited. I'm going to download some of the software and probably send you guys some emails of like, how does this work? <laughs> how do I get, how do Chris, I get Chris which way is up? The slide he could put up here at the end with a QR code that can actually get you to, you know, software and links and all that stuff. Oh, great. Perfect. Oh, there we go. Excellent. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. We really, really appreciate you guys coming for the, for, for an hour. Um, and uh, oh, thanks to, thanks to the panel. For having us. Oh yeah. Really, really great. Um, and thanks to the panel for all your great contribution in the first hour and the second hour. Um, thanks to our, uh, to our producers who asked all these great questions and kept the conversation rolling. And, uh, and thank you to the incredible team. There's a, a small village that stands up every morning to make sure that the show, that people are getting prepped and the edits are happening and all the other bits and pieces. There's a dev team that figures out how this is definitely not vanilla Zoom. <laughs> so there's a lot of things that are happening in the pipeline on the back end. Um, and then, uh, and and there's just an incredible team trying to figure out what we're doing next week and tomorrow and next month and next year. Uh, we just really appreciate all of your contribution. Uh, today, we traveled 37,000 miles. That's uh, 60,000 uh, kilometers in the Tlaloc Traversal. And that equates to 295 million bananas for scale. Let's go <laughs> ahead and uh, jump into After Hours. I'm lighting up the live view. We're testing HDR with that in the next, uh, next couple of days. Testing HDR with live view? It does, it does pass it, yeah. It, it does pass it, we've used it. I mean, I think there you just, be very careful about the compression. So like, yep. we did it in, where were we, Chris? Tokyo? Uh, so in Tokyo, we had one of our talent wandering around a fish market, yeah. and that was the only way we were getting back. But we yeah. we slowed it way down, so we picked up a latency because we didn't have to be live. Um, yeah, if you don't have to interact, I turn it up to, I, I just start turning that latency.